Tonight's guest speaker, Dr. Todd Osborne, is an associate professor of estuarine biogeochemistry at the University of Florida's Whitney Laboratory for Marine Bioscience up in St. Augustine. Dr. Osborne holds a PhD from the University of Florida and has worked to develop a research program really focused on carbon and nutrient dynamics in wetland ecosystems. He has worked extensively on restoration efforts in the Everglades. And more recently, he's shifted to, uh, to focus on restoration efforts right here in our beautiful Indian River Lagoon estuary, including a collaborative project that he's working on with Florida Oceanographics, Dr. Larray Simpson. That project aims to, uh, to restore oysters, I'm sorry, clams and seagrass to the Indian River Lagoon. So tonight, Dr. Osborne's gonna be telling us a little bit more about this really cool clam restoration project. I am incredibly excited to introduce all of you to Dr. Todd Osborne. Well, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to you and your audience. I gotta say that um, when I heard that you have hundreds of attendees for your, your lecture series, I was so excited to get the chance to, to come and speak to you. And, and knowing, seeing the list of speakers, I feel kind of honored to, um, to be among the, such an impressive group of, of invited speakers. And so um, I really appreciate the opportunity. I thank you all out there for tuning in and spending your time with me tonight to learn a little bit about our, our clam restoration work in the IRL. Now, um, the title of my talk is Restoring Native Clam Communities for Improved Water Quality. And I don't wanna leave out a very important aspect of that, which is economic resiliency in the Indian River Lagoon and the footprint in which it sits. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna acknowledge some co-authors here that are on my science team. Uh, Jose Nunez, who is my clam whisperer here at the, the Whitney Laboratory. He just retired this past summer, but he's still, still um, helping me and guiding me through some of the processes. Uh, uh, Jeff Beal, who was with FWC originally when we started this program, is now with Ducks Unlimited. Dr. Larray Simpson, who was there with you at FOS. Um, Anna Thornton, who was my laboratory manager and project manager at uh, the Whitney Lab. And Sabrina Schofield and Norm Kolsch, who are, are part of my field crew um, at, at Whitney. Um, there are way more people to thank, though, and I, I need to do that. Um, and I want to start front and center with probably the most important person in this program and the man that made this happen. And that's uh, Captain Blair Wiggins with Blair Wiggins Outdoors. You may have known him formerly from Addictive Fishing Television, um, very much a local celebrity. And uh, uh, he was instrumental in helping us move this idea forward. In fact, I've learned a lot about clams in the IRL from, from Captain Blair. And, and because of his uh, activism and his influence, uh, he, was, he was instrumental in, in getting us our first funding um, to prove the concept that we could do this and, um, and brought about awareness to the public that, that then translated to awareness, political awareness and funding opportunities. I wanna say a big thank you to, to him and his team. It's a whole family event down there. And I know that um, his wife, Carrie and his son, Drayden are all involved in this process with me. And, and I'm so grateful. Uh, I also wanna say a thank you to some of his sponsors, especially Starbright, who as a corporate sponsor helped really bring things about for us. Um, in this. I'd also like to, to say a big thank you to Mike Sullivan at Premium Seafood, who is a commercial shellfish aquaculture farmer. He also owns um, Commander Shellfish Camp, which is a restaurant here in St. Augustine, and is my right hand in propagating um, these clams here for restoration in the Indian River Lagoon. And the big money groups here that are funding this work are very important. Uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, Coastal Conservation Association, bringing the public into play, the St. John's River Water Management District, um, not only through funding mechanisms, but also lending scientific support um, from uh, uh, Chuck uh, Jacoby and his team in the Estuaries Division. I want to say a big thank you, Dwayne, to Dwayne DeFries at the, um, the uh, NEP IRL. Uh, the group there, the National Estuaries Program for the IRL is so important, and they do such tremendous work along with the IRL Council, and they, um, they brought a lot to the table financially, um, uh, logistically to help us get going, uh, as well the Brevard County um, uh, Office of Tourism, the Environmental Endangered Lands Program or EELS Program, which many of you know, uh, one of our big new collaborators, Brevard Zoo, and, and we're working on a very big project with them. 
uh, as well as uh, Keep America Fishing. Um, there are there are so many different groups and many many clubs and, and civic organizations that I can't name here. There there are numerous, but I, I have to say that this is a this has been a grassroots operation from the get go, and it has it has grown into a multi agency um, approach. And by that I mean um, you know at the at the local and state level, governments involved, but the people you. Um, have made it happen from the beginning. And, and again, I just want to say a big thank you to Captain Blair Wiggins for, for bringing this to you initially and, and really steering um, a lot of the effort that we've, we've been able to put forth, getting the word out, getting support from the public that, that translated to agency support. So thank you guys. Now, I'm probably talking to the choir when I tell you about the, the uh, Indian River Lagoon ecosystem. I mean, we're all familiar with it. Most of you live on it um, or next to it, and uh, I'm kind of like the, the the kid from out of town, being up here in St. Augustine, off the map here, path north of Ponce Inlet. Um, but my marine lab is is on the water on the Matanzas River, an intercoastal waterway here in uh, St. Augustine. And so, um, as a as a chemist getting involved in in ecosystem restoration, this has been a real a real eye opener for me. I've um, my wife is from from Brevard County, from Melbourne Beach. And, uh, and I've known the area for a long time, but only recently been able to actually lend a hand in the, in the restoration aspect. And I'm really grateful for being able to do that, especially as, a, as an out-of-towner, as you will. Um, but so the Indian River Lagoon ecosystem is tremendous. It's a 156-mile-long estuary, right? It's, it's, it's a, um, with an average depth of about four feet. That's a lot of water. And uh, um, this, the, the width of this system can range from a half a mile to five miles wide. Up in my neck of the woods, it's, it's in hundreds of meters wide. And so this is a tremendous system that's really big. And, and it, in that respect, it's made up of, of multiple big water bodies. We kind of consider Mosquito Lagoon, the Indian River Lagoon proper, and Banana River as, as the three pieces of water that make this system. Um, with a, a watershed that's over, over 2,000 square miles. Unfortunately, though, and one of the problems that, that we know about the, the, the health of the um, lagoon is that it only has five inlets that flush this. And so there, there can be distances of up to 30 miles between inlets and where we have tidal flux that moves water around. Now, back in 2007, you know, 14, 15 years ago, the estimated economic value or production in this area was around $3.7 billion annually. We know that that's skyrocketed since then. Um, however, the environmental problems that we're facing uh, are having a tremendous impact on that number. And as well as, as many of you well know, now it's been designated an estuary of national significance. That's nothing new. We, we, we claim that as it proudly. Um, and it at one time was the most biologically diverse estuary in North America. And that status may have changed given the current events. And we're not really sure. Um, but hosting thousands of plant and animal species um, is a tremendous thing for a system like this. And then a bunch of us, of course. Um, we, can't, we can't take that away. But when you think of the, the Indian River Lagoon, I mean, there's some iconic things that you think of. Of course, if you're into waterfowl, um, you know this guy, this Rosie Spoonbill. If you're, if you're a fisherman, you know gator trout and snook and and if if you just love to be out on the water you see some of the characteristic fauna like sea turtles and of course our manatee which has been in the news a lot lately right but one one aspect of the of the lagoon that sometimes is overlooked by the casual observer is the fact that it's a seagrass based system well by that is that the the primary productivity in the lagoon originally was not in algae in the water column, but was in seagrasses um, growing out of the bottom. And there's several several main species here, um, several of which are, are worked with right now and cultured at FOS. Um, and we thank you for that work because it's, it's tremendously important. But that seagrass creates the basis of an ecosystem that feeds all of these organisms. And in some cases provides them with habitat, with refugia, et cetera. But that's the, that's the, the the piece of the system that is so critical for us to regain because we've lost it in the last uh, the last decade. Now I I, I, I highlight manatees um, well because I love them. My kids love them. Everybody. I mean I don't know anybody that doesn't really like manatees. Um, however, they are iconic, and because of their plight right now and the fact that we've lost almost half of the IRL population of manatees in 2021 due to starvation. 
it makes a, a solid point and, it, and it's been in the national news that this um, situation is ongoing. And it's because they feed specifically on, on seagrasses that have been extirpated from the system, right? They've been removed through environmental degradation. And we're gonna talk about um, ways that we think we can try to help bring those grasses back. When you think of the lagoon, you see a section of the lagoon, you see clear water or, or you did years ago, many of you remember, you know, vistas like this with seagrass patches and, and open water areas and mangroves, um, beautiful water, turquoise waters um, with extensive grass flats. And in the last decade, we've, we've seen more and more of this. This is a uh, Ariumbra or a brown tide um, algal bloom, which changes the system dramatically in lots of ways. And I want to talk about that a little bit because it sets the stage for really where, where things are going and, and the unfortunate nature of, of what we observe today. Now, I promise you this is the only chemistry slide I'm going to show you. So nobody run away. I know usually at this point, everybody's like, well, it's time for a drink break. Um, but I, as a chemist, I can't help it. I got to explain something to you and it'll make sense. I promise um, this, is, this is a little bit of chemistry in it and it tells a story that's very important. On the right side of your screen, you'll see three things. C, N, and P, that stands for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. And this ratio of 106 carbons to 16 nitrogens to one phosphorus is basically the ratio of carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus elementally in algal cells, in your common algal cell. We used to call this the Redfield ratio. There's a cool guy named Redfield that came up with this. But what it shows us is how important nitrogen and phosphorus are. Now, if you're, if you're an algal cell or a plant in general, carbon is free. It's easy to get. You just bring it in and out of the atmosphere, right? So, so, so photosynthetic organisms pull in carbon dioxide. And we know from what's going on with climate change and things like that, there's no shortage of CO2 out there, right? Um, so, so that's not a limiting uh, aspect in, in algal growth. But you know, the phosphorus and the nitrogen are the parts that limit the growth of these organisms. And so, although they only need a little, a little goes a long way. And when we, when we add phosphorus and nitrogen to aquatic systems like the Indian River Lagoon, we get a tremendous response in algal growth. And that's what the figures on the left show you. Um, this is some work from Dr. Ed Flips, who is a phycologist or an algae expert at the University of Florida. And he shows, looking at, at information or data from water quality studies in the IRL, 2007, 2008, 2009, you see, you see this trend start to begin in, in 2010. There's a spike on both nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations in the water column. And if you look down at the bottom, that CHL, that's chlorophyll. That's the way we measure algal productivity or algal biomass in terms of how much of that green pigment is in the water. And you can see that they are directly linked together. And so 2010 was the beginning of what we call the super bloom in the Indian River Lagoon. And that was the really the beginning of a downward spiral in water quality. And so we, we know the, the major players here, or I call the repeat offenders, would be excessive nutrients phosphorus and nitrogen, the same kinds of things that we, we all have on our bodies. Um, the lettuce you have in your salad has carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus in it. But the availability of what we think of as limiting nutrients, limiting as in phosphorus and nitrogen, limit the ability for these plants to grow. When those elements are available in large quantities, bad things can happen. So how does that, how does that get there? Well, fertilizing our beautiful green yards is one of the ways. You know, and I know um, as a soils, I was trained in soil and water science. Um, my office mates as a graduate student were all studying turf grass. And, um, and I remember them taking classes and, and, and what types of grass and what types of fertilizer and how often and how much water. And, you know, I understand the, and, and the desire for our beautiful yards. However, applying these fertilizers in a, in a place like Florida is very dangerous. And it does boil down to the fact that we, we live on sandy soils. And those soils just don't hold anything. You ever noticed in your yard, um, a bare patch when you water it and the, the water just goes right through? The sand really doesn't hold much. There's not much there to retain those nutrients that we put on it. So every time it rains, those nutrients, those fertilizers leach right through the soil and into groundwater. It's not much different for septic systems. you know. And, I, and I've learned a lot about these over the years. Um, 
one of these every couple of hundred acres is not such a big deal. And then and nature can attenuate those signals. But when we have neighborhoods and, and, and you know, large developments based on septic systems, it can be very devastating because we do produce a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus in our waste streams, right? And what happens um, if we're out in the middle of the Okeechobee watershed somewhere on a ranch, this would not be such a big deal. But along our, our waterways, especially along the banks of the, of the um, Indian River Lagoon, septic systems drain into these sandy soils and it's very rapidly moved into the system, um, either through drainage ditches that, that drain most of our neighborhoods or um, the proximity. And so, you know, as I said, those, those sandy soils are just really quick to, to move water through, moderate water moves freely through and whatever it brings with it comes right along. And so there's a lot of work being done right now um, in, the, in the six counties bordering the, um, the lagoon to convert neighborhoods that are on traditionally on septic to sewer. And it's expensive work, but it's really important because the legacy of nutrients in, the, in our landscape could go on for years and years and years. And so if you're involved in this, this kind of work, I say, I say thank you. I also, I also encourage you to, to lobby for this with your local um, uh, politicians. Finally, I think one of the big offenders here is stormwater runoff because there's got to be conveyance of this material, these nutrients to the lagoon. And we're really good engineering wise about building our, our neighborhoods, our cities, such that we move stormwater off of our roads and out of our neighborhoods. I mean, you know, one of the biggest things outside of air conditioning that kept people from developing Florida was mosquitoes. So nobody wants lots of standing water in their yard. Um, if you've been through a hurricane, and I know several of you have, um, as I have here in Florida, you know, the first thing that happens is you get a swarm of mosquitoes a, a week or so after heavy rains because of all the standing water. So as we engineer new developments and new, new um, areas are opened up for, for um, neighborhoods and such, our drainage systems are required um, and they're, they're very efficient. What that means is every time it rains, all of the fertilizers and the chemicals and, you know, roadways are sources of nitrogen. Um, uh, the air, we, we have nutrients that literally settle out of the air. Lightning creates nitrate, right? In the, in the atmosphere, that, that literally settles out as dust, but that rain washes into our, our stormwater systems, and nine times out of 10, those stormwater systems empty directly into the lagoon. So not only are they bringing in, is that, that stormwater bringing in nutrients, it's also bringing in um, changes to salinity. Lots of fresh water that 100 years ago wouldn't have happened because the landscape would be absorbing this water and standing water and wetlands and things like that. And so some of the future techniques in, in working in our, our watershed is going to be dealing with stormwater and trying to reroute that stormwater. There's some very good projects on the board and there's some that have already been completed like the Marier Flowway in Palm Bay, which is moving tens of thousands of gallons daily westward through constructed and reclaimed wetland systems to treat water and put that into the upper basin marshes of the St. Johns River as clean water. And it's effective and it's, and it's working. So I say, you know, all of these nutrients can, can cause some trouble. Um, and we, we look at algal blooms when, when we pulse the system with nutrients. Seagrasses need nutrients too, but they take them up very slowly. Single-celled algal um, materials, you know, organisms, are rapid, you know, there's cyano, cyanobacteria, there's, there's algae um, that, can, that can utilize nutrients in the water much more rapidly than vascular plants. And so oftentimes we end up with algal blooms. We call them HABs or harmful algal blooms when they're excessive. And they're harmful for a couple of reasons. Well, first off, they can induce intermittent hypoxia. And what that means in general terms is low oxygen. Because while algae produces oxygen in the daytime through photosynthesis, it respires oxygen at nighttime. And oftentimes we'll see the effects of extra low oxygen in the water column in the morning when we, when we see floating fish. And that just means that the things have gone hypoxic, which is below two milligrams per liter oxygen in the water column, or anoxic, where the oxygen is completely gone. And that can be devastating to the biota. A second aspect of a harmful algal bloom is, is the production of toxins. Some of these cyanobacteria, some of these um, uh, algae can produce neurotoxins. 
that are that are lethal to marine biota. I mean, if you've been around a red tide, you you can experience it yourself. It can give you upper respiratory issues, um, and if concentrated enough, can make you very sick. And so there's human health elements there, but uh, you probably have heard about Southwest Florida and it's it's continuing red tide that, that repeats. Um, it's a the organism is called Carinia brevis. And it, uh, it's toxic to marine life in, in, in strong or in uh, high concentrations. So harmful algal blooms can also produce these toxins. And, and most relevant to us, I think, is the fact that just the, the biomass of algae creates a, a real, a real um, issue with turbidity, meaning it shades out the water column. You guys remember that picture I just showed a few minutes ago, the brown tide, the brown water. That is, that is blocking light. And if you were to put um, a tarp over your yard, the grass in your yard, given a couple of days, that grass will die without, without sunlight, right? No different for seagrasses. If we, the water column becomes so turbid that light does not get down to those grasses, they're gonna disappear. And it's an unfortunate but true situation. And this is what some of these things look like. You know, you can have an algal bloom with just tremendous biomass. This is all kind of blown over to the shore. Um, and, and that material during the daytime may not be as harmful as it is at night. But of course, it's creating shade at night. It uses up oxygen. And we see things like this. You, know, you wake up in the morning and the, and the canals are full of floating fish. And this is mild. Some of you have probably seen fish kills that are much more tremendous. And that doesn't just uh, turn your stomach if you live on the water but that reduces tourism, those kinds of things change property values. These are, these are big time problems. And, and even if they're episodic, they can change the function of the ecosystem. And I think most relevant to our problems right now is the fact that, that turbidity removes seagrasses. And so on the left is a healthy um, seagrass bed. You know, this is the kind of thing we were used to seeing. And then on the right is post algal bloom. You know, you can see grass biomass reduced down to maybe two or three percent. Um, in the cases now, zero percent. In many areas, it's hard to even find any any grass. And I ask a lot of the um, charter fishermen and folks that are on the water on a regular basis, the scientists at the water management district, and they say, "Well, we just don't see any. Um, it, it's it's very very hard to find, except close to the inlets where the water flushes well." So. Why hasn't this happened a long time ago? I will have to say that, that natural systems have some buffering capacity. Aquatic systems do get natural pulses of nutrients and they attenuate them because they have these tremendous communities of organisms that we call biofiltration, where they provide this service of biofiltration. They're filtering organisms. They, they filter algae and organic matter particles out of the water column, help keep the water clear, but at the same time, um, consume some of that algal productivity because a little algae is not a problem. It's just when we get a lot. And so, you know, when we overwhelm these natural systems is when we, when we see these problems occur. And so oysters and sea fans, all, all hundreds of different types of organisms that are, that are filter feeding, including corals um, in some places. And my, my personal favorite is going to be the clam, and, and that's where we're going to go with tonight's story. And I want to say that um, I learned a lot from, um, from Captain Blair Wiggins talking about growing up on the Indian River Lagoon, and even as a, as a, you know, a young charter, charter captain, um, having to race the clammers out um, on the lagoon, you know, just to get out uh, the boat ramp before lots and lots of um, of clam boats were going out. And we know from historic photographs, even from, from 100 years ago, that, that clams were prolific in the Indian River Lagoon and people came from all around to harvest them. Many of you probably remember uh, 15 years ago when you could go wade out in the lagoon and find a bucket of clams with your feet. I love, I love Dwayne DeFries has a story about that too, just being out in the lagoon, working on things and, and searching out a half a dozen clams for lunch with his feet while he was working. Um, and I know uh, Blair's told me that millions of times. They would just, you know, high pile the boat and fill a bucket of clams for lunch. I mean, they were there and they were, they were everywhere. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about their biology and why they're so important and why they do what they do. Um, but we're dealing with, with what um, many of you are probably familiar with is the quahog clam. Um, now, this, there's a northern and southern quahog. 
Uh, if you're from, from up north, you probably uh, are familiar with these as chowder clams, um, but they, they are uh, mercenaria mercenaria, so the genus and species. Um, and down south, the, the southern quahog is mercenaria compiciensis. Um, now these, these two species are independent, almost identical, They're hard to tell apart just by looking at them. And they also create natural hybrids so they can interbreed easily and have viable offspring. And so the, 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 the quahog clam itself or the mercenaria clam itself um, that, that we're seeing here was, was either mercenaria mercenaria, a compiciensis or a hybrid of the two. And they were very common, right? Um, some interesting facts about them and ones that we're gonna leverage in our story tonight is that they're synchronous spawners. And what that means is they all kind of spawn together. And that's how they overcome this uh, the great, great um, issue with spawning, releasing eggs and sperm into a giant body of water and hoping for some reproductive success is that they all do it at the same time. And it's triggered by temperature. And we manipulate that in the laboratory to spawn these guys in the laboratory. But basically in the spring and the fall, when there's alternating warm and cool water, temperature changes, it triggers them to spawn. And when one or two start, the other sense it, and it's a massive event. And so they overwhelm the predators with millions and millions of, of viable offspring. And that's how clams can be so prolific in a system like this. Now, one adult female adult clam can release one to two million eggs, which is tremendous, right? And they do this thing called benthic coupling that I'm gonna show you an example of in a little while, but that is that they have a, a unique way of pulling biomass and algae and nutrients out of the water column and kind of sticking it to the, to the bottom of the sediment, or to, the, to the surface of the sediment, which is a very important process. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. I'm gonna use a cartoon from the, the University of Florida's um, IFIS shellfish uh, extension group, but they, you know, they are, they are in the business of, of promoting commercial aquaculture. And we know that, that um, culturing of, of clams, either, either through aquaculture or naturally in the environment, they do, they do absorb quite a bit of, of nutrients. And so a one-year-old mercenaria clam can have, uh, you know, almost a tenth of a gram of um, nitrogen content in its tissues just stored in its body. And that's not counting what it takes in every day and how it, how it deals with that, but it also takes in phosphorus. And so it, it, they accumulate this in their tissues as well as some of their shell material. The other thing that they do is as they feed on, on phytoplankton or, or algae, they deposit the waste and the, the stuff that they don't eat down at the bottom at the surface. So they're pulling it out of the water column and getting it down into the sediment. And that's a really important process. That's one that is, um, we consider that an, uh, an ecosystem service for biofiltration. I'm gonna show you a video of, of how that benthic coupling works and, and why it's so important. And this was a, a video made by uh, Jose Nunez in the lab. Um, unfortunately, that seagrass in the back is just a picture, but these are mercenaria clams burying themselves in an aquarium. This is a five gallon aquarium. And we put about 30 clams in here uh, to start with. And they do their thing, they bury. And then we, we, um, we insult them with an algal bloom, right? Um, this is uh, lab grown algae. We give them some time. You notice their siphons are sticking up out of the bottom. And what's happening here is they're filtering water. And as you see, they don't consume all of that algae. Some of that stuff is coming, is being spat back out, you know? An hour later, that tank is clean. Notice all of the algae there. Whatever they didn't consume, they now have created aggregates with. And look, now other organisms can, can utilize that algae as food that couldn't before. You know, shrimp can't filter out um, loose algal particles in the water column, but they can filter out those. I'm going to show you that again, just really quick, um, because it is an important uh, important aspect. I want you to see that coupling process um, because aggregating algal cells is a huge service to keeping the water clear. Even if they don't consume it, they're coupling those, those tiny particles that are free floating into larger aggregated particles at the surface. That becomes food for crabs and shrimp and other organisms, right? Other fish 
as well as just keeping the water calm clean. And this is a tremendous service. We call that benthic coupling. And that's something that is so unique to filter feeders like clams and oysters. And then this is something that is um, critical to maintaining water clarity in our system. Okay, I hope you guys got a feel for that. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you, Jose and Jose's wife, uh, Dr. Margie, Margie Lassie, who is a, a senior environmental scientist at the St. John's River Water Management District in the Estuaries Group. Um, one of the things that we don't think about very often, but is super important about shellfish is that they also sequester carbon. And you've heard about this in the news, you know, carbon offsets, carbon credits, you know, how are we, how are we dealing with all the, the CO2 that we produce? Um, I studied mangroves and uh, uh, for a, a quite, quite a while. And one of the interesting things about those mangrove trees is how well they, uh, how efficiently they pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and grow root systems in the, in the estuary that store carbon in the ground. Well, an under recognized aspect of of clams and, and, and oysters as well, is that there are, um, there's growth there in shell material. And so your average one-year-old clam has about two and three quarter grams of carbon as calcium carbonate in its shell. Now, here's the key that I think is super important. Not only is that pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere because the atmosphere is in equilibrium with the water column. So as you pull CO2 out of the water column, more CO2 dissolves in from the atmosphere. So it is a, a direct link there, but now it's shell. Now it's calcium carbonate. It's not organic matter anymore. And we call that lithic or geologic carbon sequestration. And that's, that's just tremendously better than organic matter sequestration because it's very stable. You can pull this out, you can pave a road with it. You can put it in your flower bed. It's not going anywhere. It will take, tens if not hundreds of years to dissolve in, in rainfall. So that carbon is very stable. And that's something that just gets overlooked a lot. I just wanna mention it because I like it so much. Now, filtration rates, what, what can clams do? Clams can do a lot. Um, we've done some work on our own laboratory under specific conditions to kind of um, determine that your, your mature one-year-old um, one inch on the hinge clam can filter approximately 10 gallons of water a day. And that's, that's double some of the previous estimates that are out there in the literature. Um, a lot of things that have been done um, in situ or in the field. Um, clams are very sensitive organisms and that makes them difficult to work with. So, you know, measuring this in the field can be very difficult because they clam up, no pun intended. That's what they do when, when they feel vibrations or they feel threatened, they just close and then they don't respire for a while and that can affect their filtration rates. So we went to great lengths to, to produce information like this and find out what their optimal situation is. And so the big question comes out, well, if they're so great at filtering water and they've done so much, why haven't they fixed the IRL for us already? One hint might be that picture of the boat in the background and the 30 plus bushels of clams in that boat. Now, I've heard, I've heard about this firsthand um, from Captain Blair and, and colleagues of his and others that have worked in the lagoon for a long time. But the harvest of hard clams in the In River Lagoon has been tremendous. And uh, I, will, I will say, when you look at this graph, let's take it with a grain of salt because this is probably a gross underestimate of the real harvest of clams in the system because these were landings that are reported. Now, we all know that in, in, a, in a market situation with, with commercial harvest at a scale like this, reporting um, your harvest uh, may impact your taxes and things like that with a lot of cash sales. We think that this is about um, one third of the actual actual harvest that was going on. And I've heard stories of refrigerated trucks coming in and out of the boat ramps, just loading up, loading up, loading up. Um, fishermen coming in two or three times a day with full boats of clams to sell to markets across the country. And it was, it was a bit of the wild west for a while. Um, the eighties and, and, and mid nineties, tremendous um, clam harvest. And you'll notice that at some point uh, the clams just weren't reproducing and, 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 um, and the harvest diminished. In fact, right over here, if you can see my pointer 
around 2008, we started to see the indications of water quality decline. And it's no, it's no large leap of logic to say that there is some relationship between the loss of this tremendous loss of biomass and biofiltration capacity and the change in, in um, nutrient status and water quality in the lagoon. So what do we do? Well, the thought process, being a chemist at a marine lab, I'm surrounded by evolutionary biologists and marine biologists who talk about evolution on a daily basis. And they started to wear, wear off on me a little bit. And we thought, well, you know, perhaps if any clams did survive these environmental insults, these super blooms, these hypoxic events, the toxins from, from some of these things that, um, well, they'd probably be pretty tough. And maybe those short-term natural selections have pr provided uh, some or, or selected for some really stress resistant genotypes that we could utilize to restore the lagoon. Um, now that, that idea met quite a bit of resistance when it came to funding agents and other, other scientists simply because there was um, a, a, the, the belief that there were no clams left in the system. And so this is where I, I say again, thank you, Captain Blair Wiggins and CCA um, and Starbright and some of the, 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 the public that came out to support this initially because we needed to prove that there were a few <laughs> so that we could do this. And that's where our original funding came to go out and find these guys and, um, and test this hypothesis that, that there were stress resistant um, genetics out there that we could, we could utilize. And that's what we did. Um, I will tell you that hundreds of man hours went into finding 39 clams. And the majority of these clams were found in the Southern Mosquito, Northern IRL area. Um, you can see that basket there. Uh, no two clams were found within 50 feet of each other. And I had a team of people out there with rakes scratching and looking and consulting with fishermen and consulting with uh, clamors and consulting with um, state biologists and everybody and looking back at the um, uh, Leroy Creswell and, and uh, Bill Arnold's work, published studies of where clams were. When we went everywhere, we found nothing. And we, you know, we finally stumbled after almost two months of, of searching on 39 clams. And we took those 39 clams and said, these are the super clams. These guys are all seven, eight, nine years old. This is back in 2018. They have survived what we would call the Holocaust and, and they must be the Arnold Schwarzenegger of the clam world. They must be the toughest ones out there. And so um, we took those clams back to the Whitney lab and we applied just a, a tad of, um, of uh, aquaculture know-how to, to spawn them. And it's kind of neat. I, I always I was called uh, Jose Nunez, the, the clam whisperer, but he and Mike Sullivan um, from uh, Premium Seafood came down to the lab. Uh, we we thermocycled these guys with hot and cold water literally the day after we got them home and boom, they spawned. You know, I always say that Jose turns the lights down and plays plays some Barry White and, you know, and just gets the mood right. But it's a pretty simple process. And once they started off they went and we ended up with about 40 million fertilized eggs, right? From 39 clams, it's pretty good, pretty good stock. Now, that doesn't mean that we could produce 40 million clams. We lose quite a few along the way, natural processes, et cetera. But we can, we can you know, optimize this process in the laboratory under controlled conditions. In our facility, we take those clam eggs, we move them through a 21 day process where they go from free swimming larvae you know, um, they, they form a shell and then they set, they fall out of the water onto the bottom of the tanks and then we can scoop them out um, and start working with them. And they have a little foot and they can crawl around. And so they're, they're, you know, in the bottom right corner here at 280 micrometers in size, they are baby clams and they're, they're off and running. Now, in our facility here, this is a, a miniature version of, of what goes on in commercial aquaculture production, um, like Mike's facility up the road. But we use um, downwellers, which are basically these tanks that we add algae or river water to, and these baby clams grow. And you can see in the middle picture here, that's Jose holding one of our broodstock clams, which is about eight years old, over a million 
baby clams um, at about 500 micrometers a piece. And as time goes by, weeks and weeks go by, they get a little bit bigger, we move them to trays. And you can see on the right here, a tray of roughly, um, you know, uh, 100,000 uh, two to three millimeter clams. And that's what we call seed clams. You can see them here in the top left corner of your screen, you know, uh, two to four millimeter baby clams grown in, in our raceways where we pump river water out of the river, through the raceways and out, keep the crabs out, keep the crown conch out. And when they get to be about four millimeters, we can put them in mesh bags. And that way you see uh, Mr. Phil Cubbage here is a local waterman um, volunteering to help us. We're preparing clam bags for field planting. And then we go out and put them in the river right here in, in St. In St. John's County in the Matanzas River. And we leave them there for a couple of months. Um, we go out and harvest those, those bags up. We pull them up, we shake them out, get all the mud out, clean them, sieve them, get rid of the dead shell, et cetera. And we end up what you see in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, these are 15, 18 millimeter um, clams. And these guys are what we bring down to the Indian River Lagoon, all the way up to 30 millimeters in size. You know, but we we have them out on leases here, and you can see here at Mike's. Um, that's uh, uh, Kent Smith from FWC on the left, Mike Sullivan in the middle, and Jose Nunez on the right, looking at a tray of of uh, clams that have been sieved and ready to come down to the Indian River Lagoon. So then, we utilize uh, the structure of aquaculture in Florida, which is great. Um, we have aquaculture leases that are managed by the um, Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services or FDACs. They permit these places. Um, it's illegal to harvest off of them. And so the um, Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission law enforcement monitors them. And so we have a natural protective system. We work with FDACs and with FWC to utilize leases and partner um, with aquaculture to utilize leases for permanent colonies of clams that we set up out there. And you can see here we are on the left, we're, we're stretching out a net. This is at Turner Flats um, up in New Smyrna uh, um, area. And those nets are 50 feet long and 15 feet wide. We can plant anywhere from 20 to 75,000 clams underneath that net. And that net is very you know fine mesh. It's about 10 millimeters in, in, in uh, square um, mesh size. And we'll, we'll put that net out, we'll plant our clams down the bottom, cover them with that net for one to two years, and then we'll retrieve that net. And by that time, these clams are big and they are, um, they're too big for a majority of the clam predators out there. But those beds are dense. And the idea there is that the density of those beds allows for high reproductive um, efficiency, right? They're gonna be very efficient um, and, and, and maximize their opportunity for reproduction because they're all so close together. Remember, when we found those 39 clams, no two were close together. And another really disappointing observation that we made in, in many areas of the Indian River Lagoon was that there were no little clams, meaning there was no active reproduction. And it probably hadn't happened since, since 2010, 2011 timeframe, because we found no little guys, just the big broodstock that we collected. Now, since then, we've come across others. We found others in our work, and we have, um, we're maintaining a population of about 200 uh, clams up in St. Augustine, about 100 in my facility at the Whitney Lab and about 100 in, in Mike Sullivan's facility at Commander's um, Premium Seafood. And so we keep them separate in, in various ways to, to protect them in case of a problem. But so we, we prepare these leases. Um, these partner leases. And on the right, you'll see myself and Norm Kolsch um, cleaning Calerpa off of a, an area that we're about to plant. So we don't foul the nets with Calerpa. Um, we're, not, we're not raking up seagrass as I promised. Uh, and this is at the River Rocks restaurant, um, which, which Norm Kolsch actually used to own uh, and um, sold many years ago. And there's a 20 acre shellfish lease right in front of the restaurant. And if you're down in that area, you can actually stop, go have a great lunch, um, walk out on the dock and see um, 20 clam pots out there and all the pipes and all the markers and everything. There's also a kiosk on the beach there on the shoreline there that, that describes this project very well. And we're, we're recreating that in other areas so the public can participate and visually um, be involved in what's happening out there. It is a little bit labor intensive. Um, you guys might know uh, Captain Jim Ross here from the, um, from the radio and there's Blair Wiggins behind him. 
huffing 40 pound bags of clams. Our next step, step five in the process is actually getting the clams out there. And this is down at um, uh, Hog Point, uh, a site that has been developed by the Brevard Zoo and the um, Environmental Endangered Lands uh, Program of Brevard County. Um, really great site. There is a 70 acre lease here. And so this, uh, that area has been a very, very high um, activity area for us as well. It's close to Sebastian, went and got good water quality. And so we want to really focus in on establishing um, good populations there that will then reproduce in mass quantity and their, their offspring will move into the system, right? And so, and that's our goal. I mean, our, our overarching goal process here is to really establish these communities. And you look at the map on the right, it's kind of our, our, our mission here is to move them throughout the system. In 2020, we had several big sites. In 2021, we added more. We're into the, the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge now with cooperation with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they're, they're being ultra supportive of getting us into the Space Center area to work in that. Um, really excited about it. We've been doing a lot of work on, on former lease areas in Titusville. We've branched out to work with um, Florida Sea Grant and we, we participated in some interesting programs with them um, that, uh, that financially supported commercial aquaculture around the state to get them involved. And we're gonna repeat that again this year. And they're, they're bringing another 500,000 clams to our program um, in the spring and April. So we're very excited about that. But so it's a, it's a, it's a all hands on deck kind of effort um, and moving these guys around and maintaining those nets. As you can imagine, um, once we plant these guys, uh, and we cover them with nets, they naturally bury into the sediment and they do have predators. You can imagine the, the, the major predators of, of our clams are um, crown conch. And there's a couple of really good videos by, by Blair out there um, on ways to cook those if you're so inclined. Um, I would say eat your fill uh, of crown conch. We have a, we have a huge crown conch um, explosion population thing going on up here in, in the St. Augustine area. And so they're prolific. Um, they do eat oysters and clams. Um, but other major uh, predators of clams are things like uh, stingrays and red drum and black drum. And while we're sure we feed our fair share of those organisms, um, we do wanna protect these guys for the sake of um, their reproductive quality such that they can um, reseed the environment. In a couple of banner years of reproduction, you could see you know, billions of clams added back to the system. And we know that it's a stepwise process. So our goal is to create these, these um, scenarios where there's high densities of, of clam populations and their reproductive um, potential is maximized, the so success. What you can see here in the bottom right is Jose's uh, kite camera. And when you, when you look down the string there, you see us standing in the water. This is at River Rocks and you can see the nets. As algae grows on the nets, you can start to see those 15 by 50 foot sets and there's eight or nine of them. And when this picture was taken back in 2019, um, they, as they, you know, as we added nets and they get covered, you see them. Now we do remove those nets after one to two years, depending on the growth rate of the clams. And there's a reason for that, of course, and that is to protect um, the other animals in the system. These are, these are monofilament net materials. We do recycle them. We take them back to the lab and clean them if they're not damaged too, too bad. Um, or we, or we throw them out and, and um, dispose of them properly. But the main issue is that we do not want them to get loose. Um, we check them and maintain their anchoring on a regular basis for that very purpose, uh, because um, they could be, they could be um, fouling potential for other organisms. And that's not what we're about. We don't want to wrap up a sea turtle or a manatee in a big floating net. So a majority of our effort is spent monitoring these sites and maintaining these nets and their anchorage. And then we remove them. And so a lot of places that we've planted clams back in 2019, 2020, those nets have been removed already. And those beds are, are open to the environment, but the clams are also big and, and resistant to predation. Now, so how have we done? Well, this year marked our, um, our 12 million clam point and then some, um, you know, you'll notice that uh, around the, the system, we've, we've put in a lot of organisms. Uh, I will say that uh, at the eel site, at the hub site with Brevard Zoo, we have seven and a half million clams, but a, 
a, a large portion of those clams were small little guys that we seeded oyster reefs with because there was some natural coverage that the zoo had already, um, the Restore Our Shore program and the zoo had worked to, to rebuild some oyster reef and we seeded them with the little guys you see in the middle picture here. But a majority of what we put out um, is what you see over there in Dr. Rex Ellis's hand in the black um, lycra top. You know, it's 20 millimeter, 25 millimeter um, adult clams. And, and you know, at, at 18 months old, they are reproductive. And so that's a really important point to make is that they, um, they are viable and can reproduce the, the, the following spring that we put them out. So one year in the system, you know, or less and six to eight months growing and these guys are ready to go. And so we're, we're really proud to say that we passed the 12 million mark and, and we've got plans to do as many in 2022 fiscal year 2022-2023 um, with funding um, secured from National Estuaries Program, IRL NEP, and IRL Council for Bard Tourism, and of course, uh, um, FWC is coming to the table with major, major funding that you probably just heard about in the release from Governor DeSantis, uh, over $400 million for um, environmental resiliency in the state, and some of that money is headed to the IRL, which is great news. Now, some of the, you know, there's some, there's some opportunity to see how things are going. We've established a lot of plots um, up in uh, uh, the Southern Mosquito Lagoon. This picture on the right is not all us. This is what, this is one of our sites. Some of this is commercial work on Mike's lease. Some of this is ours. So we can't claim all of that, all of those nets. But those black net outlines are our clam sets, you know, the stuff down here in the bottom right of the picture belongs to our project in perpetuity. And he has graciously given us the opportunity to plant clams there and not harvest them. The things that he is doing commercially are separate and they're off to the, the top left corner of the picture. Um, but uh, we're, we're measuring survival rates upwards of 88%, which is amazing. Um, you know, each year that's going to decline some. And, and after two or three years, we noticed that we're around 60, 65% survival, which is okay. I mean, I mean that's, that's tremendous given what we're doing. Um, and we've noticed that in that area, blue crabs are like our big problem. You know, we've got a lot of crab activity in um, the Southern Mosquito Lagoon. They seem to be the, the, the major offenders in that area, right? Um, if you go to JB's Fish Camp and have lunch, you can look across the waterway and see this um, see this, this, this site. And then there's another major site of ours, which is called Cedar Creek, just around the river bend. And we have um, almost a million clams planted out there too. Um, also in the Northern IRL area, um, we have another, another big plot and a big site of, of 17 plots. Um, this is, uh, you know, a survival rate of about 70%. And we're not noticing, we've, we've noticed some crown conch problems there. But um, a majority of our of our issues come from rapidly changing salinity, and that's that stormwater I'm talking about. You know, we notice our, our algal blooms ha happen in the summertime when the summer rains come back. We've also seen, um, you know, like in places like Samson Island Restoration Project with Nick Sanzoni and Satellite Beach, we notice some some dieback from you know rapid changes in salinity, and that's just due to stormwater. You know, we had a, a dieback in one of our sites there that was that was significant due to a two inch rainstorm, you know, that just put a lot of fresh water into the site and clams like uh, 14 parts per thousand up to full strength seawater. You get below 15 to 14, it's very stressful for them. And if that persists for more than a week or two, it's a, it's a big time problem. And so, you know, that's, that's the kind of threshold, physiological threshold that they can't go under for very long. Um, like I said, I think uh, the Sebastian Grant area down down at um, the hub site is a tremendous one. This is a day out with um, lots of lots of our supporters. You know, we've got uh, CCA and, and Florida Sportsman and Blair on the pontoon boat bringing clams over to us, and that's that's myself and Norm and uh, Dr. Simpson in the in the foreground there rolling out a net. Um, this area has had really good survival, really good growth rate, some crown conch issues, um, but we've had a lot of cover net issues here because the fetch is long across the, the, um, the river. But also we found that dolphins love this area and I've, I've observed them playing 
around the nets and, and just kind of, we've, we've had to go to great lengths to anchor these nets. We use um, tubes full of, you know, like uh, sand, cinder blocks and, and tent stakes to hold these nets down, where in most cases we just use um, yard staples to do so. Uh, but because there's so much animal traffic over these nets that, that kick them up, we, we have struggled to keep them in place. But it's a great site and it's very productive and the clams are growing like gangbusters there. So we're very happy about that. Um, just to put it in perspective, you know, based on that uh, 12 million clams, we can do a quick, you know, off the cuff estimate of about 120 million gallons of water being filtered daily across these sites. Sounds like a lot of water. It is a lot of water but it's just a drop in the, in the IRL bucket, so to speak, you know? And so, so we got a lot of work to do, um, but, you know, over a ton of, of nitrogen stored in biomass, you know, 380 kilograms of phosphorus. Notice this number at the bottom, 36,000 kilograms. That's about 80,000 pounds of carbon stored in shell alone. And the cool thing about this is that these guys are actively produ reproducing this grows every year not only what we put in there every year to increase those numbers but natural recruitment should be you know lighting things up and that's that's a really big um, goal for us now we've also gotten quite a bit of um of interesting uh, uh awareness i want to say that um well i'll start with the fact that we've observed some seagrasses at, at, at um, our melbourne site which was great Little, little sprigs coming up, little clusters coming up here and there in shallow water. Um, I can't claim that that's because of, the, of the, the clams there, but I know we got a lot of clams keeping the water clear there. And I'm just really happy to see, and we're optimistic to see those, those things happening. Um, the project uh, as a whole did receive a, a really nice award from um, MRC for the best restoration project in the IRL in 2020. And, um, and this is a picture of, uh, of uh, Captain Blair Wiggins and the family um, and Danny from Starbright accepting that award on behalf of the project at, uh, at their annual dinner. Um, and, and, you know, these guys have been instrumental. I can't thank them enough for their public awareness, you know, between the television show that, that they produce all of their, their radio spots with Jim Ross and the, and the um, Catch a Memory radio show that's local, all the newspaper articles, all the news, social media posts that, that these guys are, are constantly putting out there, get the word out. And so we've got a lot of, of positive recognition there that's so important. Um, it's so important to get the public, you guys, involved in these projects and, and help them move forward. Um, we do have quite a few registered volunteers, and I'm going to invite you to be be one of them tonight. Um, lots of lots of positive uh, response in social media. Lots of project videos. If you look at um, Blair Wiggins Outdoors Facebook page or website, um, or if you just if you just Google IRL Clam, you're going to see YouTube videos, interviews with with all of us talking about different aspects of it. It's been in the news media locally and across the state. Um, and we've gotten a lot of response from the public. You know, I'm not going to ask you for money tonight, but I am going to tell you that if you're interested in donating, you can. And, and we've raised over $62,000 and just from these kind of public outreach events. Um, and it takes 10 cents to put a clam in the water in the IRL with this program. And so you can see it's, it's been impactful. Um, I want to show you a couple other numbers just to put things in perspective, because I know I'm running out of time here, um, but I want to, to give you a perspective about the potential here. This is, this is our year one numbers with some projections. In our first year of operation, we put 2.35 million clams out in the lagoon. Let's just pretend that they're all still out there. Um, and we know that's not the case, but we'll just use this as a number exercise. Uh, 23 million gallons of water filtered on a daily basis, right? And these are the numbers of, of nitrogen, kilograms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon. If we, if we assume that a very, very, very conservative estimate of reproduction, that, that these clams are going to produce 10 offspring that survive in the million that they throw out there. And one of the things that nobody really knows is how to track that. It's really difficult to know how many actually survive fertilized eggs survive. But if they're in high density and they're, they're reproductively successful, let's say they grow by a factor of 10 every year. In five years, you know, there's, there's a lot of clams out there. Um, 
in five years, that is an amazing amount of clam productivity. You look across the board there, those, those numbers, E to the eighth, that's, that's eight zeros. <laughs> that's add, add eight zeros behind that decimal place. Okay. So um, we're talking about millions, hundreds of millions of clams, billions of gallons of water filtered and thousands, you know, tens of thousands of kilograms of nitrogen and phosphorus and, and almost a million kilograms of carbon stored in their shell. These are, these are big numbers. And it doesn't take a lot to think about, well, you know, hey, um, if we could do this on, a, on an industrial scale, on, a, on an impactful scale, we could, we could make a huge dent in water quality problems in the IRL. Not to say that clams are doing everything, they're not. They're not the one answer. I want to reiterate that. Clams are one of the answers to our problem. You know, the lagoon has been, has been, um, has suffered death by a thousand cuts. And so I always say we need a thousand band-aids. And so all those different programs that are out there are doing their thing. You know, there's clams, there's oysters, there's septic to sewer, there's fertilizer um, restriction. There are stormwater abatement projects. There are mangrove restoration projects. There are seagrass restoration projects. All of these things work together and they're all critical parts of the, of the, the functioning of a very complex ecosystem. If anybody's ever seen like a, like a food web or a ecosystem diagram, it's just lines every which way, everything's connected. And so each one of those elements has a part in the solution to the lagoon. And we think this is one that has been under, under recognized for a long time. Um, but one that we're going we're gonna to promote and push forward in our team. So some preliminary conclusions that, you know, that we can do this at, at the laboratory scale, at the commercial scale, um, and utilizing uh, those brood stock, we think we're onto something here with, with some uh, genotypes that are highly resistant to the stresses that are currently in the lagoon. If you look past this picture of Blair and Kerry Wiggins um, putting clams in in Titusville, you can see the water. And you can see what we're dealing with and just how rough that is. But that these clams were, were happy and they, they did put on significant growth rings in this water condition, which was tremendous back in 2020. We do see good survival rates. Um, and that means that we're doing things right and we're, and we're planting appropriately. You know, I totally believe that, that full impl implementation will result in tremendous filtration capacity, right? Um, we anticipated reproduction in the spring, mainly in the spring, but sometimes in the fall too, for all of our sites. And that natural re recruitment will increase initial performance of this project. And in fact, we have great news last fall and, and last spring, we were able to observe live villagers in the water column. You know, water samples that we were taking around our sites while we were down there, bring them back, look on the microscope. And, and what do you know, we actually observed baby clams swimming around. So not a lot of them, but you can imagine there's a lot of water out there. So capturing one in the microscope is not an easy task, but we did see it. So that means that they're there. Um, and, you know, it just proves a point that these organisms can be leveraged to improve restoration success in the IRL. Now, my favorite part is where are we going from here? You know, um, big thank you to all of those folks that, that have helped us get this far. And we've got a lot of work to do. You know, our future plans include engaging commercial aquaculture because that was that is a that is something that is it is important in the Indian River Lagoon itself. There are commercial clam and oyster leases all up and down that are regulated by FDAX, and there are that is business, um, private business that can support utilizing these clams and others to filter water, and then they harvest them out of the system and sell them for food. So there's an economic benefit there, but there's also a filtration benefit and an actual removal of those nutrients from the system. So I wanna engage commercial aquaculture and we're working with, with some of these growers already to get them seed of our genetic stock and promote the use of that genetic stock in their growing operations. Um, of course, we're monitoring survivorship and reproductive success, trying to estimate how much impact we're having. And we wanna keep doing this. I think this is the next three to five years is our window to really bring clams back to the Indian River Lagoon. That's, that's, the, that's the goal. And, and we need to hit it big and we need to hit it hard to be impactful. And that's the, that's the, the main thing that we're after here is, is doing this at a scale that's impactful. And part of that includes continuing to, to educate the public 
to involve the public and engage you so that you can tell your, your leadership in your county, in your state level, what you want to see. Hey, we want to see septic to sewer. Hey, we want to see clams in the IRL. We want to see more work on this. And, um, and oftentimes that's what makes things happen. That's what made this happen. This picture here, you see um, Blair, Jeff, Dwayne, uh, Jose, and myself at a fundraiser that, um, that Captain Wiggins put together with CCA and, um, and uh, you know, IRL council, Dwayne DeFries came to the table with, with a, a big check to start us off. This was an amazing night, it was awesome. And you know, this was the kickoff. Can't say thanks enough. Um, something that's very, very, uh, um, probably on your minds from the Southern portion of the IRL is like, well, what are you doing down here, man? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm headed to your neighborhood. In fact, I've teamed up with your own Dr. LaRae Simpson from FOS um, on a grant that we're actively doing this year in which we are extending the boundary of the project from the focus point, which has been the Northern IRL areas, you know, um, from Ponce all the way down to Sebastian. Now we're moving South from Sebastian down to, um, to uh, Port St. Lucie. And we're going to be installing beds down here. Um, Dr. Simpson and her team are going to be monitoring those beds and helping helping me pick those locations and kind of taking taking the lead on the southern portion of of um, the IRL clam project. And uh, and that makes it really more efficient. And we've got we've got a great team there to help us with that. And it doesn't hurt that they're working with seagrasses at all, right? And so the other aspect of the work that we're we're um, finalizing with um, FWC for fiscal year 22-23 is that um, we're going to do some co-restoration of clams and seagrasses. So working specifically with FOS. And I'm, I'm really glad that, um, that I know Larray and I'm really glad that FOS has her because she's a tremendous force to be reckoned with when it comes to productivity. Um, she's a mangrove expert that is, is lending her, um, her talents to seagrasses. And, you know, FOS has been very productive in seagrass restoration. And we think pairing these restoration techniques could be very successful. So we've done some experiments, we're planning some, some others, but what we're trying to do is, is co-restore seagrasses and clams together. Because the clams provide the seagrass with, they're pulling those nutrients out of the water and, and that benthic coupling process, which is getting nutrients down in, in the, the root zone areas of, of seagrasses. It's improving water quality directly overhead, right? So allowing light um, and nutrients for growth. And at the same time, the seagrasses are providing clams a little bit of protection. One of the ways that we keep stingrays off of our, off of our clam sites is to put lots of little uh, um, sticks on our nets because for whatever reason, they just really don't like coming over our nets and they can tear holes in nets, the bigger stingrays. But if there's something there, we use just a little bent pieces of wire um, that they touch, they don't like it. And so while they will still get clams out of seagrass beds, seagrass offers some protection. The, the root structure, the rhizome structure, and the cover um, provide clams with some protection. So they're getting something out of the deal too. Um, and and that's, that stabilization of sediments and the protection from predation is, is a benefit. So we believe that those two could be done together. And so what that would, in, would, would mean at the end is increased survival growth and production of both species, both the clams and the seagrasses. If we put them together and their synergy could be very beneficial. And so we're gonna be doing that, especially down here um, in your area, but also in the central portion. Um, and our, and our, our approach is to do this, you know, with, with um, grass plantings with and without clams in lots of different areas and monitoring the growth and um, the robustness of those plantings. So we're doing that together and that's happening this year and next year um, at, a, at a fairly impressive scale. And so there's gonna be a lot of collaboration between the Whitney Lab and Florida Oceanographic Society. And I was just really excited about all of that. Now, my pitch to you in closing is to get involved. You guys are a force to be reckoned with too. Um, there's nothing like motivated volunteers. And I'm gonna tell you, here's a picture of us planting clams at Samson Island. Uh, there's about 30 people out here tossing clams in the air. And we just had a great time that day. That was on, on an amazing day uh, of, of uh, clam planting. This is from Nick Sanzoni's project at Samson Island up in Satellite Beach. And, um, and I wanna encourage you 
I'm not going to give you uh, Dr. Simpson's cell phone number um, to, to get on her list or anything like that, but I will tell you that you, you know, working through FOS or through the Whitney Lab website or through um, the IRL uh, Clam Restoration Project website, you can get on our volunteer list and we'll get you out there and we will get you wet and dirty planting clams and seagrasses and it's fun. And I want to encourage you to do so. Um, there's nothing more fulfilling, I think, than doing hands-on work that you know is having a positive impact on our environment. And if you love the, the lagoon, and I know that you do, or you wouldn't be listening to me talk about it for an hour, um, these are opportunities that we want to engage you in. And if you're not working on our project, get involved in one of the projects that are going on. There's so many organizations doing so many things. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a thousand ways to get plugged in. And that's how we're gonna make it happen. You know, Government is slow um, and underfunded and there's a lot going on out there. And so when the public gets involved and hands get you know, brought to the, to, the, to the problem, together we can do a lot. You know? And I wanna give you a little cheerleading vibe there. Like, hey, you know, together we can make things happen. We can make changes through education and through absolute you know, hands-on action. So please do your bit get involved. And with that, I'm going to say um, one more time, check out the Indian River Clam Restoration Project.org uh, and uh, Blair Wiggins Outdoors to get more information. And we, we welcome your participation and hope that we will hear from you. Okay. That's wow. my bit. Wow, Todd, that was, that was awesome. Uh, this is such a cool project and it, it really is uh, just amazing to see how much effort you, your team, and your collaborators have put into this? You know, we've got this this pretty large toolbox of tools that we can that we can use towards the restoration of the Indian River Lagoon. But this project really seems to have a, a high importance as we look at all those various tools. So it's exciting to see the work you're doing, and it's even more exciting to see that work expanding over the next couple of years. We have some fantastic questions that have rolled in throughout the evening tonight. Uh, I hope all of you will stick around for a few more minutes. We've got maybe. 10 or 12 minutes of Q&A time. I'll, I'll try my best to get to as many of these as possible, knowing that we, we might not get to all of them just because you guys have so many great questions. Uh, the first question I have for you relates to substrate. One of our viewers wonders whether changes in substrate in the Indian River Lagoon from sandier areas to muckier areas will impact the viability of transplanted clams. So yes, yes. Um, clams are, clams are a, a finicky bunch sometimes. Now, uh, the relationship is as follows, right? Clams love sandier substrates, um, but the bigger the clams are, the more um, adaptable they are to, to other substrates. So um, as, as sediments get softer with more of the muck materials that we find in deeper waters, uh, baby clams don't like that very much. They have a hard time staying close enough to the surface, but the big clams do just fine in it. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an age size thing. But yes, they can they can um, can live in those softer substrates. Have uh, have you tested the survivability of these clams to red tide toxins? They've been exposed. Um, now we're not working with that specifically in the laboratory. There's a lot of a lot of issues with that. We've got some partners um, on the Gulf Coast that are doing the same exact thing. They're working with clams. They're, they're paralleling our efforts here in the Indian River Lagoon in places like Charlotte Harbor and Sanibel Island and places along the, along the Southwest coast. And they're finding very similar things. There is a subset of genetics and, or, or genes in the gene pool there that allow surviving some of these um, toxic uh, harmful algal bloom events. And so there is some resistance to Carinia brevis and it's been shown um, by the, uh, the Gulf Shellfish Institute um, group down there. Uh, Ed Childs and, and, and his group are, are a, a large proponent um, force for using clams for restoration. And they're finding positive results on the Gulf Coast with this. And we haven't directly tested our clams with Carinia brevis, but we know that it's been present here and that, that these clams have been exposed to it, at least our broodstock have, um, and survived it. So one of our guests wonders why the broodstock clams that were still out in the IRL in low densities, why they weren't recruiting naturally. And they're curious as to whether you think there might be a phase shift in macroalgae species or even microalgae species that might be impacting larval and juvenile clam survival in the wild. Very possible. That's a great question, a very informed question. Um, we think that while there, was, there are definite shifts in food source 
we believe that the spatial extent of their of their separation was their biggest um, hurdle for reproduction, meaning that I didn't find two clams next to each other, you know, literally 30, 40, 50 feet apart when we got into an area where we could find a few um, more than more than one at a location, per se. And that that distance is it might as well be from here to the moon when it comes to um, egg and sperm getting together in an aqueous environment. Think about, you know, three, three feet of water and a football field. If, if you're a clam and you're at the 50 yard line and your mate is at the, at the end zone, you, you could put out billions of eggs and sperm, but they're, you know, the chances of those two getting together um, in a viable time frame is, is almost zero. And so what we feel like is the, the most likely answer is that um, they were just too spatially disparate. And so bringing them together, I mean, and the interesting part was when we brought them together, they were ripe and ready to spawn um, that, you know, they were all reproductively ready. All 39 of those clams contributed to that spawning event in the lab. So that tells me that they weren't, they weren't inhibited uh, in any physiological way. However, the distance apart, they were probably, you know, releasing eggs and sperm on their own, but the chances of them just actually being connected together was just too, too low given the, the distance apart. And so that's kind of part of our strategy is to get them close together. We put 50,000 clams under one of those nets. They are shoulder to shoulder and they like it and they, um, they're comfortable that way. And so that's what we're kind of targeting is minimizing that distance so that the chances of, of egg fertilization is really, really high. We, we have a couple of guests with questions about commercial clam harvesting in the Indian River Lagoon. One guest wonders whether there's a current moratorium on clam harvesting in the IRL and, and whether the clam fishery is, is utilizing the leases that you mentioned only or whether they're harvesting from areas outside of the leases. And then there, there's another, another question along the same lines. You know, if clams are successfully reestablished, how can we avoid over harvesting them as we've done in the past? Uh, you know, th this is a, 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 a tremendous effort to restore populations from an ecosystem perspective, not a commercial perspective. How do we avoid the, the, the swing in the wrong direction from the, from the commercial side of things? All right, well, let me unpackage that one. That's a, good, that's a good series of questions right there. So currently, no broad harvest, just, you know, just random harvest going on in the IRL. There, there is a moratorium on that. There is no just go out and rake up some clams. That activity is, is not permitted. Waters are closed. Um, the only areas where clamming is occurring is on commercial leases where, where um, commercial aquaculture is actually propagating and growing uh, clams for harvest for seafood products. And these, are, these areas are few and far between right now, given water quality issues and things like that. And that's very highly regulated by FDACs in Florida um, for the protection of the public and the consumer, but also um, for the aquaculture itself, that it needs to be in areas where there is, there is good water quality. And so um, lease activity is ongoing in some areas, but many of the leases that were traditionally present are, are what they call administratively closed to production like Titusville's lease complex is completely closed. Um, New Smyrna is open, um, areas around Sebastian and Grant are open and there is some active commercial clam operations going on, which we are really happy about. Um, but, you know, our colleagues, our fisheries biologists colleagues with FWC learned a lot. You know, no one was really, and, and, and nobody gets thrown under the bus here, back when this was happening at such a kind of unregulated pace, um, no one thought that there would be an end to clams that were just so plentiful and, and it wasn't being monitored in a way to regulate it stri strongly. If we ever get back to a very healthy clam population, I believe that a, a measure of success would be the ability for the public to go out and harvest clams and have dinner. That would be amazing. That would make me so happy to see that fishery returned. But if it ever does return, our lessons have been learned. My colleagues at FWC have learned so much. These are brilliant fisheries biologists and, and they're not gonna allow an unregulated harvest to ever occur again like that. There will be, there will be rules and regs involved with that. But we're, we're a ways off from something of that nature. Right now, um, we're, we're relegated strictly to, um, to aquaculture on managed lease properties. 
we had several different guests just inquire about the lifespan of a clam. How long do these things survive for in nature? Well, this is kind of cool, you know. So clams, you, you've probably seen um, the, the the giant clams in the South Pacific uh, that can live a hundred years, two hundred years. These are amazing. Our our uh, quahog clams lifespan about fifteen years, and so a lot of our brood stock right now is is approaching. 10, 12, we've got a couple that are maybe 13 or 14 years old, you know? And so um, those clams are, are reaching their, 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 you know, their maturity end of life kind of thing. But a, a, a natural quahog clam can live 15 years. And um, if you're out in the, in the environment and you find a shell or you find a live clam, you can age them. But it's not by how you might imagine just by rings, but it's by indentations in those rings. And those are feeding years, you know, between warm and cold water. And so if you run your finger down the shell, you'll find those grooves and you can approximate their age that way. If you, um, if you notice, sometimes those grooves are really big and sometimes they're very small. And that also tells us a little bit about the environment in which they were growing in, which is kind of neat too. So um, if you get a chance to look at a, a fresh clam shell or um, a, uh, a live clam, you know, I want to hear about it if you find a live clam somewhere, please. Uh, but if uh, if you get the opportunity, it's kind of neat to see and age them. And 15 years is about the, the the high end of what we expect their natural lifespan to be. We have time for just a couple of more questions. So I'm, I'm trying to filter through these for the ones that uh, that hopefully will have the, the broadest appeal. And again, I apologize if I didn't get to your question. We, we just have a limited amount of time tonight and some fantastic questions. Are you able to compare the efficiency, the costs, the benefits of, of oyster versus clam restoration in the lagoon, specifically with regards to water quality? So here's a here's a big there's two big problems here. Um, one is that in such a large volume of water, you know, being able to determine an effect is difficult, right? Um, we've got some experiments going on right now where we're measuring water quality kind of contained within a high density uh, planting area with, um, with water quality instruments. And we can see some differences, but when there's a lot of water there and a lot of, a lot of um, volume, it's difficult to show, you know, without a doubt that these are, these are doing something. Between clams and oysters, and we know oysters can, can filter tremendous amounts of water too. In fact, more water per, per unit organism oftentimes. Um, but I wanna, I wanna make it clear that these are, these are, these are um, both very valid restoration organisms. There's been a lot of work done in oysters and, and they each have their niche, they each have their place. You know, um, Oftentimes with oysters, because when we grow them, there are there are different sets of rules in the state of Florida for moving them around. It's interesting that that may be one of the bigger hurdles is more uh, legal than, than biological when it comes to working with oysters versus clams. You know, um, there are a little bit more stringent rules with oysters. Uh, however, they can occupy the same locations and work together. Oftentimes we find clams actually growing underneath oysters because the oysters provide them with some natural protection. Um, and oftentimes we find them very disparate locations, you know, uh, subtitle oysters in my area don't exist. Uh, they are, they are, um, they are tidal. Um, in a lot of areas, clams can be in deeper water, much deeper water. And so while they can, they can complement each other, they can also be utilized in different different um, aspects. And so we've done a lot of work with, with oysters and we've had, we've had great success and we've had some failure with them. You know, there's, there's some natural barriers to them. And we're gonna find the same kind of thing with, with clams. In some places they really take well, in some places they don't. And there's some science to be done there. Um, however, I think both are really valid. And I think a challenge for us as scientists is to be able to show not just through their productivity and measuring and inferring on their biomass changes and their growth rates and things like that, how much impact they're having, but to actually be able to visualize cleaner water, um, impacted areas is a, is a thing of scale. And so I don't think we've reached the kind of scale yet where with either oysters or clams, we can pinpoint a change in, in water quality and say it's because of them, um, but we really want to. I mean, that's, that's a goal that we have is to, to be able to, to bring that kind of um, impact 
and visualize it in measurements that we can make in the water column. You, you spoke a little bit about future collaborations with the aquaculture industry. Are you currently working with commercial shellfish hatcheries to propagate clams for outplanting? Yes. Yeah, so my 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 main collaborator here um, is Mike Sullivan, and he maintains some of that brood stock. We have we have worked with some other growers. Um, in fact, uh, uh, we worked with Tom McCruden down at FOS, um, and and so and we can plan to continue to do so. Uh, there are there are opportunities there. For us to work with these guys and we're, we're exploring them uh, piece by piece. Part of that uh, hindrance is water quality in particular areas and the reason that that we've kind of focused a lot of our efforts up here is that the Matanzas River is, is a really high quality uh, water and the, the growth phase of these organisms is very delicate in the beginning. The bigger the clams are, the more hardy they are. And so, you know, we've, we're, we want to expand into other, other avenues, and in, in especially in commercial production. Um, the problem or the hindrance is location, right? And so we're still exploring some of those opportunities. One of the things that we feel like we might be a better approach for us is not so much at the hatchery stage, but at the um, outplant stage where we can start getting um, getting funding to provide uh, commercial aquaculture with seed that we can we can bring up to a reasonable size up here and then deliver to them to use. You know, a lot of a lot of aquaculture operations buy seed from from hatcheries around the state or even out of the state, and we want to start influxing this genetic material, these types of clams into aquaculture and, and get them to adopt that as, as one of their products because they, they are viable and they're doing great um, and they, they can be commercially utilized. So that's, that's, a, that's a goal of ours. And we're, we're in some discussions with some, some other groups right now that do have hatchery operations. It's, um, it's a location game though that, that kind of hinders that aspect of it. We're, we're a little bit past eight o'clock, but you know what? We have well over a hundred people still logged in. I, I'm going to keep going with maybe another question or two before sure. we call it quits for the night. This is, uh, this is our chance to pick your brain and I, I want to take advantage of it. You showed a graph earlier of commercial harvest and there was a really pronounced decline around 1990. Do you have any idea what triggered that, that first decline in clam harvest in the Indian River Lagoon? So there's been there's been some speculation about that. Um, there's been some some discussion about a couple of different events. One was was uh, water quality changes due to some storm events that may have halted uh, the viability of of clams in terms of human health for consumption. It was one aspect of it. And then there was some some other issues with potential changes in in um, population where things were harvested pretty hard. There was a gap there as that fishery recovered. And then, you know, we, were, we hit them again really hard and, and then they didn't recover. Um, I'm leaning more toward the aspects of water quality. Not that there were, there were tremendous events per se, maybe, maybe some hurricane events that brought in fresh water, but the state does um, take human health very seriously. And so whether it be through FWC or through FDAX, water quality testing for enteric bacteria or fecal coliforms usually shuts down a harvest for a while if things get, um, get bad in terms of, uh, of uh, human health for consumption of shellfish. And you'll see that in the commercial um, uh, world all the time around, around St. Augustine. We, we expect after a, a half inch or more of rainfall that harvest will be closed for five days. And that's to protect the public from just runoff and the bacteria that naturally are accumulated in shellfish. There are some dangers to eating shellfish, you know, and those those um, those dangers are that that those types of certain types of bacteria are are concentrated and you know from from rain events from the landscape, especially fecal coliforms, and those need to be purged out of the shellfish before they're consumed. And so there's a there'll be a harvest moratorium for a couple of days or a week to let that dissipate and naturally move through the organisms and then harvest can, can restart. That could be extended given weather conditions, given large scale problems like hurricanes or, or impacts. And it could be that there was a fresh water influx there that just knocked the population down and, and the harvest wasn't viable for a while. I don't know. 
Um, I've read a couple of different uh, accounts of that and, and heard different stories as to why that was, but I still think there's a lot of speculation on, on what that gap was, was all about. All right, we'll, we'll wrap up with one last question. This is, you know, you talked a lot about the broodstock of these, these super clams surviving through some pretty poor water quality. This viewer was wondering what, what specific qualities enable those original super clams to survive when most of the other clams in the estuary didn't make it? Well, I think the, the, the specific genes are still unknown. We've been doing some work at Whitney to try to understand that a little better. Uh, some molecular biology uh, techniques to understand both genetic diversity and particular um, genetic sequences that, that may lend us um, some information as to specific genes. But in a general sense, I like to liken it to um, our human adaptations for stresses. For instance, um, uh, let's take you and I. You spend a lot of time in the sun fishing and you have a tan. I spend a lot of time in the sun fishing and surfing and playing in mangroves and I'm just a different shade of red. And it, it is a very <laughs> subtle difference in our, in our, in our genetics and our ability to, to handle that sun and to, to deal with it. You know, very subtle, you know, across the, the, um, the human spectrum that that can be very pronounced in skin color and, and melanin content, right, to, to adapt to high sunlight condition, but we're all still the same species and those those genetic traits are very subtle. The difference in our ability to you know, deal with sunlight and the resulting skin color, things like that. Um, you know, I take I take this one as another example. You know, there there's a lot of bald guys out there with me um, and it doesn't seem to relate necessarily to eye color or height or weight or age or any of these other factors. There's a lot of a lot of subtle genetics that come into play with that. And so within the population, let's just say that um, too much sun on my on my head would cause me undue stress and take me out of the gene pool. Well, if we're all out fishing, you know, sooner or later, all the guys with um, with, with more hair on their heads are going to be fishing and there'll be less of guys like me out there, right? It's, it's not that simple, but it kind of is. It, these, these subtle genetic traits that allow for um, a little bit more tolerance of low oxygen content or a little better tolerance of um, the irritation of picoplankton in the gills, any of these times, or, or just susceptibility to um, the, the toxins produced by harmful algal blooms. I mean, we look at the, uh, maybe a better analogy I'm just thinking of now is, is the human response to COVID. I just got done with two weeks of COVID at my house. Um, very, very mild. My neighbor down the street did not fare so well and was hospitalized just a few weeks ago. We're in the same age bracket. Um, we're in the same socioeconomic class. We're in the same everything. You know, he's he's the father of two kids too, um, roughly my age, forty eight years old. Our our subtle differences in genetics resulted in very different responses to the exposure of that virus, right? And so, and we see that in the in the human population right now, all over the place. We're you know we're responding to COVID in, in much in very different ways, uh, and I think the clams are in the same same boat. There's a series of genes there and genetic programming that are allowing some of these guys, a very small number from what we can tell from our surveys, to get through all of those stressors. And so that was really the, the, the impetus for this work was to take that small, unique genetic subset and procreate them and use them as the initial wave of restoration. Now, some people will say, well, you don't want to bottleneck the genetics, and that's absolutely true. As water quality gets better, there will be natural influx of other genetics, and we will be bringing, as part of our projects, diversity in clam genetics back to the table so that we don't end up with kind of like a monoculture of one specific subset of, you know, bald guys that don't deal with the sun very well in the lagoon as clams. So, so that's, the, that's the, the kind of strategy that we're using we're, we're focused on those traits right now, but our bigger picture is to expand the diversity um, as we improve water quality so that the, the population itself is very diverse and very healthy um, for, other, for other reasons. 
All right, Todd. Well, thank you so much for an absolutely incredible presentation tonight. And I guess more importantly, thank you for all the work that you're doing to try to help fix the Indian River Lagoon. I'm personally excited to see where this project goes over the next few years. And, you know, I just, I, I see it as a really positive opportunity for, you know, for our community to get behind an effort that will have the potential to have tangible results. To everybody in our audience tonight, I want to challenge you, do me a favor, share the lecture series with your friends and family members, bug people to join you, get people to watch. You know, we've got a great audience week after week, but because we're doing this virtually, there's really no limit to how many people can log in. Uh, we've got a fantastic lecture next week, all about manta rays. That would be a great one to share with, with your friends and family members. It's, uh, it, it's a very public friendly topic and mantas are charismatic. So I think that would be a, a, good, a good lecture to share if you don't mind. I hope to see all of you back here one week from tonight. And again, Todd, thank you so much. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you all.